Good afternoon, and welcome to this special session on communicating geohazard risks, uh, risk assessments. I'm Mike McFadden, president of the American Geophysical Union. The verdict and prison sentences delivered on the 22nd of October this year found six Italian scientists and one government official guilty of manslaughter in the wake of L'Aquila earthquake. This news shocked the scientific community worldwide. At AGU, we found the verdict troubling and feared that decisions like this could ultimately discourage scientists from advising their governments, from communicating the results of their research to the public, or, in extreme cases, discouraging people from even studying in certain areas of Earth and space science. The facts of the L'Aquila case are complex, and they brought up many questions about scientists' role in communicating geohazard risk assessments. This special session was added to the fall meeting program to discuss the complicated process of both assessing and communicating risks associated with natural hazards. I would like to thank John Bates of NOAA and Steve Sparks of the University of Bristol, UK, for organizing this session on such short notice. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn the podium over to John, who can introduce the panelists. Thank you, John. Thanks, Mike, and welcome. I'm John Bates. I'm also the chair of the AGU Meetings Committee, so welcome to our meeting uh, on short notice. And thanks again to, to uh, Steve for helping uh, co-convene this session, and thanks especially to our speakers who were so generous uh, in their time and in responding to us on short notice to help put together what we think is a very important session. What we're going to do here is have a presentation by each of the three speakers, about 20 minutes each. Uh, hold your questions because then after all the speakers are done, we will have an open uh, question and answer and discussion uh, session. There is much to discuss and uh, look forward to that. So our first speaker is uh, Thomas Jordan. He's the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center at the University of Southern California. And he's going to speak on lessons of L'Aquila for operational earthquake forecasting. Well, thank you, John, for organizing this session, Steve, and inviting me. I'm happy to be here. And uh, John, I want to congratulate you on a fantastic AGU meeting. I think we should give them a round of applause, don't you? I think a lot of the specifics of this case are known to people in this audience, uh, but I'm going to start off with a brief review. In the early hours of April 6, 2009, a strong earthquake, moment magnitude 6.3, struck the city of L'Aquila in central Italy, killing 309 people, injuring more than 1,500, and leaving tens of thousands homeless. In June 2010, the Vice Director of the Department of Civil Protection and six scientists associated with the Commission on the Forecasting and Prevention of Major Risk, which is a big advisory body for DPC, were in indicted on charges of criminal manslaughter. After two judicial reviews, the case was ordered to trial, which began in September 2011. On October 22nd, guilty verdicts were handed down to all seven defendants, who were each sentenced to six years in prison and together fined more than 10 million euros. Well, reaction to the indictments when they were first being discussed was, in the scientific community around the world, I guess you would say furious. It appeared that the indictments blamed the scientists for not alerting the local population of an impending earthquake, what we would call a failure to predict. Well, it's well known that large earthquakes cannot be accurately predicted in the short term. So why would an Italian court try to punish scientists for not doing something they didn't and still don't know how to do? Scientific societies around the world, including the IUGG, AAAS, AGU, the Seismological Society of America, wrote statements, letters of protest to Italy's president. And I think uh, the first AGU statement came out, uh, I think it was probably June of 2010, is typical, and I'm going to quote part of it. 
Despite decades of scientific research in Italy and in the rest of the world, it is not yet possible to accurately and consistently predict the timing, location, and magnitude of earthquakes before they occur. It is thus incorrect to assume the L'Aquila earthquake should have been predicted." End quote. However, court documents that were eventually filed by the prosecution cast the accusations not as sins of omission, but as acts of commission. They charged the scientists with conducting a risk assessment that was, quote, generic and ineffective, providing civil authorities and the public with, quote, incomplete, imprecise, and contradictory information about the nature, causes, and future developments of seismic hazards, and characterizing the seismic swarm that affected L'Aquila for about three months before the main shock as, quote, a normal geological phenomenon. In sending the case to trial, the L'Aquila judge agreed with the prosecution that public statements made by the defendants, quote, thwarted the activities designed to protect the public. Well, what really happened in L'Aquila? It's been emphasized in many reports that the facts of this case are complex. The seismic activity increased in late 2008 with felt earthquakes in early 2009 prompting school evacuations and other preparedness measures. Beginning in February, media coverage was inflamed by amateur earthquake predictions issued by Giacchino Giuliani, a local man who worked at the Gran Sasso National Physics Laboratory. He used techniques based on radon concentrations measured with a gamma ray detector of his own design and analysis techniques uh, of his own invention that are so far unpublished. The predictions had no official validity but were widely reported and taken seriously. In fact, they caused some citizens to evacuate their towns. The two events that were reported that he predicted uh, widely in the press were false alarms. There is no evidence that he transmitted a valid prediction of the main shock to the public or any civil authority. I met with him shortly after the earthquake for two hours, and uh, he admitted that. In response to the February predictions, the National Institute for Geophysics and Volcanology, INGV, stated publicly that there was no valid, validated method for earthquake prediction that earthquake swarms were common in this part of Italy, and that the probability of larger earthquakes remained small. Assur these assurances were technically correct, but they did not dispel public concern. On March 31st, DPC took an unusual step of convening an open meeting of the Major Risk Commission in L'Aquila. We now know from t wiretaps that were released during the trial something about the intention of this meeting. The head of the DPC, Guido Bertolasso, told a local official, as recorded in these wiretaps before the meeting, that the experts were meet, to meet up, quote, not because we are frightened and worried, but because we want to reassure the public. Bertolasso explained to, uh, to the official that the meeting was to be a more of a media operation. The experts were going to say, and I'll quote him again, it's better that there are 100 magnitude four tremors rather than silence, because 100 tremors release energy and there won't ever be the damaging tremor. At the meeting, the MRC concluded, there is no reason to say that the sequence of small earthquakes can be considered a sure predictor of a strong event. I'm sorry. Can you go back one? I can, yeah, can we go back one slide? I must have hit it. Yeah, sorry about that. So at the meeting, the MRC concluded there's no reason to say that a sequence of small magnitude events can be considered a sure predictor of a strong event. This statement was scientifically correct, although I think very few seismologists would consider it to be complete. At the press conference before the meeting, the DPC vice president, Bernardo de Bernardinas, who is not a seismologist nor was a member of the uh, Major Risk Commission, said, quote, the scientific community tells us there is no danger because there's an ongoing discharge of energy. 
the situation looks favorable. That statement was not scientifically correct. The tremors continued into April, prompting more school evacuations, and then shortly before 11 p.m. on April 5th, a strong magnitude 3.6 earthquake shook the city. In a Nature interview, Vincenzo Vittorini described how he debated with his wife and his terrified nine-year-old daughter whether to spend the rest of the night outside, which is a customary response to seismic activity in this part of Italy. Recalling statements claiming that each shock diminished the potential of a major earthquake, he persuaded his family to remain in their apartment building. Seven people were killed in the collapse of the building, including both his wife and daughter. And it's this type of testimony that uh, was used repeatedly by the prosecution. In fact, nearly everyone in L'Aquila, including the prosecutor, lost relatives and friends. A few weeks after the L'Aquila disaster, the Italian government convened an international commission on earthquake forecasting for civil protection, ICEF, which comprised 10 scientists from nine countries on which I served as the chair. In fact, I think there are four members of this commission attending this meeting. We were charged by the DPC to report on the status of short-term forecasting methods and to make recommendations how they might be more effectively implemented for civil protection. We met in L'Aquila, Potsdam, and Rome, and we issued our findings and recommendations on October 2, 2009 in L'Aquila, about uh, less than six months after the earthquake. Our final report, which is entitled Operational Earthquake Forecasting, State of Knowledge and Guidelines for Implementation, was peer-reviewed, revised, and published its entirety in Annals of Geophysics in August of 2012. As defined by the ICEF, operational earthquake forecasting involves two key activities. The continual updating of authoritative information about the future occurrence of potentially damaging earthquakes, and the officially sanctioned dissemination of this information to enhance earthquake preparedness in threatened communities. We documented a number of scientific conclusions relative to OEF. We confirmed that there is no reliable method that has yet been discovered for predicting large earthquakes with high short-term probabilities. However, seismic hazards do change with time because earthquakes release energy and suddenly alter the tectonic forces that eventually cause future earthquakes. Statistical models of earthquake interactions ca can capture many of the short-term temporal and spatial features of natural seismicity, such as the excitation of aftershocks and other seismic sequences. These seismicity-based models provide the highest validated probability gains of any short-term forecasting method. Now, under favorable circumstances, these probability gains can be quite high. They can be factors of 100 or 1,000 relative to the long-term average. However, the short-term probabilities of large earthquakes always remain low, even areas of high seismicity, typically less than about 1% per day. And these probabilities, I have to say, uh, also have high uncertainties. We studied practices in six high-risk countries that were represented on this commission, China, Greece, Italy, Japan, Russia, and the United States, and found that preparedness actions appropriate for such high-gain, low-probability situations have not been systematically investigated. In all of these countries, the standardization of OEF procedures is only in a nascent stage of development. And the incremental benefits of OEF for civil protection relative to long-term seismic hazard analysis have not been convincingly demonstrated. So under these circumstances, it's not surprising that government agencies with statutory responsibilities for earthquake forecasting have been cautious in developing operational capabilities of this sort. The lack of OEF capabilities is one of the reasons the Italian authorities got trapped in L'Aquila. From what the scientists knew a week before the earthquake, a big shock was not very likely, and this was emphasized at that March 31st meeting. With retrospective calculations, the probability of a false alarm, if an alarm had been cast, exceeded the probability of a failure to predict, if an alarm were not cast, by a factor probably greater than 100. Even so, the seismic activity had increased the probability of a large earthquake by a comparable factor, probably about a factor of 100, above the long-term average. Now, distracted by Giuliani's predictions, 
Authorities did not emphasize this increase in hazard, nor did they focus on advising the people of L'Aquila about preparatory measures warranted by the seismic crisis. Instead, they were snookered into addressing a, kind of a, a simple yes-no question. Will we be hit by a larger earthquake? And of course, they could make no conclusive answer to this question, but to calm the population, which was upset by earthquake alarms, they made reassuring statements that were widely interpreted to be what we might call anti-alarms, that is, categorical statements or deterministic predictions that a large earthquake would not occur. And it's this perception that lies at the core of the L'Aquila accusations. Now, I can see no merit in prosecuting, prosecuting public servants who are trying in good faith to protect the public under these chaotic circumstances. With hindsight, their failure to highlight the hazard was regrettable, but the inactions of a stressed ad risk advisory system can hardly be construed as criminal acts on the part of individual scientists. Moreover, the Bertoloso wiretaps indicate that the GRC was compromised into endorsing a predetermined but scientifically flawed conclusion. One can only hope that in the appeals process, which we assume will be going on this next year, that judicial sanity will prevail. The L'Aquila verdicts are tragic, but they provide us with an opportunity to think through some of the larger issues that will surely recur for scientists involved in hazard management. Among the main lessons of L'Aquila is the need to separate the role of science advisors, whose job is to provide objective information about natural hazards, with that of civil decision makers who must weigh the benefits of protective actions against the cost of false alarms and failures to predict and must take into account lots of other information, uh, political, economic, and so forth. L'Aquila shows that confusing these roles can lead to big trouble. The ICEF conclusions, well, I should say we concluded at the ICEF that the best way to achieve the separation was to use probabilistic rather than deterministic statements in characterizing short-term changes in seismic hazards. We recommended that the DPC should support development of seismicity-based forecasting methods to quantify short-term probability variations, and we made a series of recommendations on the implementations of these, of this, uh, these OEF systems. The public, and I'll just sort of list some of the main recommendations. The public should be provided with open sources of information about short-term probabilities of future earthquakes that are authoritative, scientific, consistent, transparent, and timely. This information should be made available at regular intervals during periods of normal seismicity as well as during seismic crises in peacetime as well as war. The public must be educated into the scientific conversation through repeated communication of what is known, what is not known, and what can be expected. Agencies should not try to deliver new types of information during times of crisis. Public advisories should be based on operationally qualified, regularly updated seismicity forecasting systems that have been rigorously reviewed and updated by experts in the creation, delivery, and utility of earthquake information. The quality of all operational models should be evaluated for reliability and skill by retrospective testing, and they should be under continuous prospective testing against established long-term forecasts and alternative time-dependent models. In our report, we recommended that the International Collaboratory for the Study of Earthquake Predictability would provide an adequate uh, possible infrastructure for this purpose. Now, in this age of instant communication and high bandwidth uh, information, Public expectations regarding the availability of authoritative short-term forecasts are evolving very rapidly. There's greater danger now that information vacuums will spawn informal predictions and misinformation. L'Aquila demonstrates why in this media-rich environment, OEF capabilities are a requirement. They're not an option. And given these developments, we recommended that alert procedures should be standardized to facilitate decisions at different levels of government and among the public that earthquake probability thresholds should be established to guide alert levels based on objective analyses of costs and benefits, as well as the less tangible aspects of value of information, such as gains in psychological preparedness and resilience, and that the principles of effective public communication 
which have been established by social science research, should be applied to the delivery of seismic hazard information, for example, the consistency of messaging. Of course, we must keep our perspective and not allow a focus on short-term forecasting to undermine sustained efforts to reduce risk. The ICEF emphasized that the long-term models currently used are the most important forecasting tools for civil protection against earthquake damage. Nevertheless, properly done, short-term forecasting complements long-term seismic hazard analysis in promoting earthquake preparedness. The age of operational earthquake forecasting has arrived, and there is an urgent need for focused research to improve our technologies for risk reduction. These span a continuum from long-term seismic hazard analysis and operational earthquake forecasting through earthquake and tsunami early warning and the gathering of post-event information for emergency response. Taken together, these technologies can be used to track earthquake cascades and thereby reduce seismic risk and improve societal resilience before, during, and after their occurrence. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Our next speaker is Max Weiss. Max is the director of the World Agency for Planetary Monitoring and Earthquake Risk Reduction. And he has the title that's a bit, uh, should prompt us all to think, who is responsible for human suffering due to earthquakes? Max. Thank you. Yes, this is a strange title, and, but it seems to be the question that has been asked here. I want to show you, it doesn't go forward, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, first I'll talk about L'Aquila, the scandal that everyone talks about. And, but then I also want to bring up Emilia Romana earthquakes. These are smallish kind of earthquakes that killed people in a way, well, this is kind of a scandal in my consideration that no one talks about. And then India. A seismologist was forcefully deported because he brought to light seismic risk. So I'm, I'm broadening the view a little bit to the problems that seismologists uh, face when they are in contact with this uh, problem of um, losses or yeah, human suffering. Staying in the ivory tower or not? Should we um, take refuge in the ivory tower or, or should we uh, commit ourselves? The court case in L'Aquila is uh, not something where the prosecution did not focus on discrediting the scientific statements. It was not that much about science. It was more um, the prosecution argued that the sum total of the communication by the government representatives and experts amounted to falsely um, reassuring the population that a disaster was not going to happen. It appears to me that the notion of communication also included silence. So people who didn't say anything were apparently guilty. My conclusion is that the case was mostly about communication, not so much about science. We need to examine what happened uh, in detail. It's a complex story, and uh, the first point that I want to stress is that the, het the duties were heterogeneous among the actors that were, who were convicted. So seven, seven men were convicted, but some of them had a job of coordination, preventive action, and informing the public. This is the group on the left. That's the government officials of the civil protection agency that Tom Jordan also mentioned. Then there was this commission on high risk or committee on high risk and they were uh, charged with evaluating facts and uh, making recommendations and on the right hand side over there you see a scientist who was um, supplying scientific data and keep that man in mind because I'll come back to him. <clears throat> A note, a footnote here that uh, Enzo Boschi sent me in which he said 
to me in an email, I formally signed an official document where I stated that INGV, that is the Institute, the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology, researchers will never give information on earthquake and volcanic activity, otherwise they could be prosecuted. And it was the job of the Civil Protection Agency to communicate, that is. So, it's also important to know who are the individuals who participate in that crucial meeting. And that's uh, too complicated a table to look at in detail, but again, it's the left side are the government officials from civil protection, in the middle, members of the high-risk committee, and on the right-hand side, the uh, scientists who provided data. So, um, Tom Jordan has already set the scene. There was a seismic crisis, aftershock, uh, earthquake swarm was happening, people were upset, a false, uh, a, um, false prediction was uh, circulating, and so people were very upset. And at that point, on, on 30th of March, the decision was made to hold a special meeting, and that's the delib deliberation of the Committee on Great Risks that took place on the 31st of March. So time goes downward in this slide, and I boxed this, the, the deliberations, because that's the crucial event. So what happened the day before, as already Tom has mentioned, Bertolasso, the head of civil protection, was overheard on the telephone to say these uh, words in red. It's better, okay, well, the ex experts were going to say, he already knew what the experts were going to say, and they were gonna say that uh, small earthquakes will um, make it safer and safer because they reduce the energy and of course that is something that experts would never say, guaranteed, because we all know this isn't true. Uh, they, I could make a, a little bit exaggerated analogy, take a few tons of water out of the ocean and you reduce the danger of a tsunami. Okay, it's a similar situation. Okay, the next thing that happened was that the vice chairman or vice president of civil protection, De Bernardinis, gave a TV interview before the deliberations and again repeated that incorrect statement and saying the scientific community tells me and uh, it's absolutely not true that the scientific community could be telling him this. Then the meeting was held, and in the meeting itself, there are minutes of the meeting. In the meeting, the scientists said all the reasonable things. This is a high-risk, uh, high-hazard area, one of the highest hazard areas of uh, Italy. It is, uh, has had an earthquake that was very devastating in 1700 and whatnot, but the probability that it, this swarm is followed by such a main shock is very low. 2% or something like this. After the meeting, De Bandanis con con uh, conducted a press release to which the seismologists were not invited. They were on their way home. They didn't even know it took place. On the next week, there was this... Um, all the, um, the residents of L'Aquila felt relieved. They said, okay, oh, that's wonderful. We hear there is the more tremors, the safer we are. And that is, as Tom stressed, the court of the accusation that people felt they were led to believe that they are si safer now. It was, that was not the case for the mayor of uh, L'Aquila who participated in the committee's meeting. He was more worried after this meeting because he realized that the uh, experts really didn't have an answer. And he, uh, he uh, canceled school the next day. But then he let school to, uh, be, to proceed like normal after that. And after this week passed, then of course we had the devastating earthquake. So, um, I present to you a portrait of a criminal. F field expert uh, his field of expertise, PhD in seismology, he, his function is Director of National Earthquake Monitoring Service, job description, Monitor Seismicity of Italy, 
activity in this particular case, delivering data on the latest seismicity to this commission. Public statements, none. Rendered opinion, none. And he was not asked an opinion. Court decision, guilty of manslaughter, six years in prison, 300,000 euro fines, uh, fine. Um, he loses his job. He uh, can never hold a position in the government again, and he loses his pension. Additional consequences, uh, there are preparation pending for civil suits, and he may be in the courts for decades. In my opinion, this portrait also fits the two seismologists on the committee and the earthquake engineer. How can an earthquake engineer be responsible for any kind of statements or expertise in relation to earthquake uh, swarms? So the Instituto Nazionale, that's the uh, INGV, is uh, collecting le letters of support for their scientists. And if you want to write your own letter of support, many organizations have already uh, sent letters of support and they have a web page where you could uh, add your own opinion. On the other hand, there is a group of seismologists who wrote a letter to the President of the Republic of Italy. And I quote some text out of this letter and a very typical phrasing is, at the bottom you see there the last few words, the people who are protesting this action are, have very little respect for the Italian ju judicial system, according to this group. Portrait of a different criminal. We're going a little bit afield and see other problems. Again, it's uh, somebody who has a PhD in uh, geophysics. He's a professor at a university. His top uh, description is research and teaching. And then his special expertise is earthquake hazard and risk in the Himalayas. So the public, he made a public statement and co-authored an article that was critical of seismic hazard analysis for the site of a future uh, nuclear power plant. And the consequences, oh, he rendered an opinion that this uh, was not uh, safe to do that. And the consequence was he was forcibly denied entry without exp uh, explanation as he arrived in an airplane in Delhi on his way to Bhutan. He, he didn't even want to go to India, but he was forcefully detained and returned on the next flight to the United States. Now, if you think that there's not a, a good way, uh, Steve Wisniewski has prepared a letter of support for Roger Billum that I have here, and you can take a copy and see whether you would want to possibly uh, add your signature to this letter that Steve prepared. So now the conclusion one I have is seismologists are damned if you do and damned if you don't. Unless you spend your life studying details in the deep interior of the earth or uh, I could, uh, then you, you're not going to be bothered. <clears throat> On the other hand, there are, it's not everything so wonderful. In the moderate size earthquakes in Emilia Romana that happened in 2012, this spring. Look, the magnitudes were not even six, but numerous people were killed by modern industrial facilities, which collapsed, and it was at night. There were very few people, luckily, very few people at work, because one factory after another, one warehouse after another. I have dozens of photographs like this, and I press OK, dozens, literally dozens. They all collapsed at the magnitude 5.9. And look, these um, storage uh, tanks, they are the, the notorious most thing that would first fall over in shaking because the weight is all up there and they have spindly legs. They stand up, but the uh, fa facility loses its walls and part of the roof collapsed. That is unbelievable to me. Here is a uh, facility that killed two workers. At a stone's throw, 
50 meters from that, an old farmhouse, the worst construction in the area, unreinforced, un un abandoned, not maintained, didn't collapse. Two kilometers down the road, in these bottles on the shelf of this bar did not fall, did not fall off. That means it didn't shake very much. When I brought this to the attention uh, of a very well-known uh, leading earthquake engineer of Italy, he said, what do you expect? This is normal. He used the word normal. Facilities constructed like this are bound to collapse. Okay, so the conclusion too I have is that if one shows this kind of attitude, people get upset. I would be upset too. I think that people expect that experts care and try to help them as much as they can. So, is everybody who attempts to help reducing earthquake risk at legal risk? That is the standard advice. Drop, cover, and hold. You may know that from California, but then this is what happens in earthquake. And now in parts of these buildings, that uh, advice, uh, uh, drop, cover, and hold, is uh, ineffective. And now could then a person say, oh, the person, I was led falsely to believe I would be safe under a table, and here my family is dead, uh, although they did what they were advised to do. Is that now um, grounds for sending the person to jail who gave that advice? I have a third type of a criminal. That's the mass media. Case in point, magnitude 6.6, North, North Africa. My, I, my job, my, I reported four minutes later after the earthquake happened, probably 1,000 fatalities and probably 3,000 injured. Swiss rescue team offers help to the concerned because it's a Swiss rescue team I'm working for. International TV station, earthquake in North Africa kills two people. Consequence, civil protection in North Africa rejects help on the ground that nothing serious has happened. F second consequence, I get reprimanded for being a foolish uh, professor somewhere doing crazy calculations. Consequence three, people bleed to death under the rubble of their homes because no one comes to help. F okay, they were, um, and in the end it was 650 people dead. All right. Should the TV station be taken to court? Well, that would be hard to do. My own seismic risk, my job description, estimate likely numbers of casualties within, within less than an hour. For any word, uh, earthquake worldwide that may have the potential to be a problem. So what I, I my products is an email alert in real time. As fast as I can, I send out a message like this with a map of mean damage and an estimate of how many killed, how many injured, and what the intensities were in the cities uh, and, and villages around there. And another uh, product, uh, another thing uh, that we do, is we estimate fatalities in possible future earthquakes. Everybody knows the Himalaya is bound to have some more magnitude eight plus earthquakes, and in that case, I think one should ask what will be the consequences. The, the bars that you see on the left lower side, it's, uh, the scale is two times 100,000 fatalities. So the height of the bar in the bottom there is 200,000 fatalities. The injured may go into ex exceed a million. So now, am I going to be hauled off to jail if I... Uh, underestimate the damage of an earthquake in real time and therefore the rescuers don't go and that means I'm killing people by stopping the rescuers? Or am I gonna be in the trouble like Bill and Billim, um, uh, Roger Billum if I go uh, to India next time if the wrong person lead, reads my article? So luckily up to now, nobody has read my article so uh, I'm safe. <laughs> It's in a scientific journal, Natural Hazard. So these official, uh, I guess I was lucky. So my future seems a little bit cloudy. 
errors in loss estimates are unavoidable. They will happen again, and I have made them in the past, but most of the time I'm actually right. And uh, yes, I, am I perhaps at risk to go to jail or be deported from India? But perhaps I should uh, stay in the ivory tower and amuse myself with studying stress drops, what I did in my youth. But I made the decision that, oh, in the lucky luck case, I was actually lucky. I es estimated within 22 minutes of the quake that there may be 270, uh, 50, uh, 75 fatalities, plus minus 200 to plus minus, pretty large. But uh, it was accurate, as it turned out, uh, two weeks later it was known that 309 people died. My decision is that I continue to work as best as I can and help people to protect themselves for this. So I was asked, what would you have done? And it's, of course, easy to say afterwards with hindsight. Yes, install seismograph network, hold town meetings for general education. Uh, teach people how to reduce their risk and how to react in strong shaking. And an important thing, calculate the risk. I would have calculated the risk and come up that with a magnitude 6.5 is likely to kill 500 people. We've done that exercise with firefighters and civil protection in Umbria. And they were very, very receptive and very happy that I gave them quantitative measure, uh, estimates of what an earthquake would do in this part of their state or in that part and which city would then be uh, uh, affected in what way. One thing I would have definitely assured and that, um, that told the people, I'm, I'm certainly um, certain that I would have said, go and build yourself an earthquake closet. I think that we need a seatbelt for against earthquakes, like tornado shelters exist and are for sale commercially. We should have an earthquake closet, a strong protection unit that could be in the corner of my house or my apartment. And if somebody would have built themselves that with the strongest uh, studs that he could find in the lumber yard, he would have increased the chances of surviving of his family by at least 1,000, uh, possibly much more. And it's something that you can dash in in five seconds where, when you feel uh, the P wave, the first small motions come up. Overall conclusions, I have the following. Civil protection officials and the whole, all the group of all the people, um, experts that uh, work on the problem should not only earnestly try to help the people, but they also must be perceived to be earnestly helping them. And if they're perceived to be uh, casual and make jokes about drinking a glass of wine, and it's, it's a bad a situation. The, that the fact that all these seven men were e condemned in equal measure is incomprehensible to me. I can't understand how this was not seen, and I believe this again reflects the arrogance of not going to detail, not caring, not looking at the detail and what really happened here. Officials who are ignorant about earthquakes to the point of saying such wrong uh, statements have no business talking to the public, in my opinion. And so we n need to educate the public, but apparently also the officials, because uh, we have officials who, who don't uh, know what's, uh, what's going on. And, and they, they, need, they are the first ones who need education. And another thing we're lacking, seismologists are lacking, a pro protocol to what to do in seismic crisis. The volcanologists have much more uh, formulated what they should do in a volcanic crisis, and that is probably because it's more uh, frequent that you have. I'm told that in Italy there is a seismic swarm going on right now that was longer, more extensive than the Lucky Luck case. And again, there is the problem of what's going to happen next. And in Italy, apparently, there are about uh, 12 or, uh, swarms like this per year. Thank you.
Thank you, Max. Our third speaker is uh, Stephen Sparks. He's a professor at the School of Earth Sciences at uh, the University of Bristol in the UK, and he's going to be speaking about scientific advice, risk assessment, and communication during volcanic emergencies. Steve. Thank you very much, John. What I'd like to do is to share with you some of the experiences of the volcanological community after, over the last few decades in terms of uh, some of the issues that uh, arise in the L'Aquila case. Uh, the, uh, as uh, John said, there's uh, the characteristics of volcanic emergencies, and then Max mentioned that uh, these things happen quite often. I guess the volcanological community has some experience at uh, dealing with some of these difficult issues. I'd first likely like to share with you the characteristics of typical volcanic emergencies. Commonly, there is unrest prior to a volcanic eruption, earthquakes, defamation, and gas. And this unrest has timescales typically of hours to many years. A problem we face is that, uh, in fact, most periods of volcanic unrest do not lead to eruption, and therefore we are faced with the false alarm problem of uh, raising concerns because of the activity, and then nothing happens. When eruptions do happen, they can last for days to decades. Uh, uh, volcanoes have multiple types of, par of hazards. They can have mud flows, uh, volcanic bombs, pyroclastic flows, uh, ash fall, a whole variety of different hazards that have to be de dealt with simultaneously. Many variations uh, leading, uh, 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 occur during volcanic eruptions, leading to the need to continually monitor, forecast, assess the hazards over protracted periods. There are, of course, high stakes, loss of life and livelihoods. Evacuations may be necessary. Economic losses occur. And uh, just as in earthquakes, there are large allergy and epistemic uncertainties which really must be taken into account in making forecasts and assessments. And good communications are key to successful emergency management. I'd like to start off with what you might call either the epiphany or nadir in uh, volcanic uh, crisis management, which was the crisis of La Soufrière Guadeloupe uh, in 1976. And the volcanological community learned many valuable lessons from this. What happened was that the volcano, if you look at the, uh, the map on the left, the volcano of La Soufrière Guadeloupe uh, sh uh, went through a period of several months of volcanic unrest. Uh, the blue area, uh, light blue area, shows you the areas assessed to be uh, under threat, and something like 70,000 people uh, lived in that area. The, uh, there were six during this period of several months. There were 16,000 earthquakes recorded, 153 were felt. There were very small steam explosions or phreatic explosions of minor volume, and uh, anomalous emissions of water, CO2. Uh, 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 H2S and SO2. And it's an example of what sometimes is called a failed eruption. Magma is trying to get to the surface and failed to do so, so the uh, major eruption did not materialize. But of course, the stakes were extremely high. This is a Caribbean island, and you, the neighboring island of Martinique. Uh, in 1902 suffered one of the greatest volcanic tragedies. You see in the black and white photograph uh, the town of Saint-Pierre where 29,000 people were killed uh, by a devastating volcanic blast. And uh, the Guadeloupe volcano was very similar, so uh, naturally there was a real concern. The crisis led to the evacuation of 73,000 people uh, people over six months, estimated loss of 60% of the gross national product of uh, the island, 106 billion French francs, and 15,000 jobs were lost, uh, but uh, there was some state com uh, compensation. But as the title of this slide shows, this was a huge risk communications disaster. There was a great public disagreements between experts, uh, some who thought that the, uh, this was not going to lead to a volcanic eruption, uh, a major volcanic eruption, and therefore thought the evacuation was unnecessary, and another group of scientists who thought there was real danger and uh, advocated the evacuation. And these, public, these disagreements between scientists were very public, involved the media, and uh, I think uh, there was a there's a significant legacy in terms of trust uh, on the island even today. 
should say I'm grateful to J.C. Kamarovsky of IPGP for uh, providing me this information. The lessons learned. Clearly, science, scientists should avoid very public disputes, even though science, of course, uh, often uh, involves disputes uh, 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 as a common discourse of science. There are clearly limitations of a very deterministic approach that it would definitely erupt or definitely not erupt, and uh, uh, the Manchian attitudes of the, uh, the protagonists were uh, clearly harmful. And by that I mean taking these very entrenched, uh, diametrically opposed views in public. And this was in the face of, in fact, large uncertainties. So uh, this, the lesson learnt was that there's a need for systematic evidence-based approach to forecasting uh, hazard and risk assessment. And I will comment uh, later in the talk on how to uh, in incorporate uh, disputes between scientists as a form of uncertainty, and I think we've uh, found how to do that. I think the next advance in uh, volcanology was the introduction of probabilistic approaches. As far as I can judge, uh, the first structured methods of using event trees with probabilities on branches was used by the USGS in the Mount St. Helens eruption of 1980, and the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program of the USGS has been using event trees or, uh, as a uh, formal way of uh, structuring their, uh, uh, their forecasting and hazard assessment. It's a rather complicated slide, but this is actually from a retrospective study um, by our French colleagues on Guadeloupe. And what happens is in the branch, you have a decision, uh, uh, you're, you're forecasting, is it going to be a magmatic er eruption or is it going to be uh, a case of unrest without eruption? And then if it's an eruption, is it going to be explosive or is it going to be lava? If it's explosive, what's, how big is the explosive eruption going to be? Is it going to produce pyroclastic flows? How far are they going to go? And you go through the event tree and you populated the branches of the event tree with probabilities of those different or alternatives. And so uh, that's, that was introduced uh, into volcanology. Again, uh, thank Chris Newhall for uh, providing that information. Another uh, failure in volcanology was the Nevada del Ruiz eruption in Colombia in 1985. The facts are there was an ice-covered volcano uh, covered by a glacier. It had a modest explosive eruption on the ice cap. There was rapid melting of the ice cap to form a lahar. This went down to the village of Almero, 40 kilometers or so from the volcano, and the village was uh, buried with 23,000 deaths, one of the great volcanic tragedies. Uh, actually, though it seems to have been some good hazard maps and assessment already available, so here it wasn't so much a failure of, of science as the management system that did not work. Now, this is from Barry Voigt's work, who's uh, uh, retrospectively analyzed what happened in Nevada's Ruiz. Uh, I think if you look at the management structure, which obviously involves uh, civil protection, scientists, local and regional uh, uh, committees, and the public, and so forth, it's quite complicated. And what I just want you to notice is that the black dots between the boxes represent parts of the management system which worked. And you can see that they're mostly black dots. In other words, this was, a, on the whole, a good management system. But there were two failures. You'll see there's an open circle, little open circles, uh, and a couple of them. That's where the management system didn't work, which led to the tragedy. And uh, you can see that there was a, a problem with communication between regional and local emergency management uh, committees, and also between the local management committee and the public. In other words, the people in Almaro were not warned in time. And the lessons learned, and this is from Barry's work, the worst can happen, and the, uh, the analysis suggests that the local authorities were unwilling to bear the costs of an early evacuation or false alarm, so took uh, action too late. Hazard maps need to be provided for civil protection early. Uh, first, mitigate the most valuable sites, work out which are the most vulnerable places and plan the decision criteria uh, uh, when you're going to make a decision, for example, to evacuate. And test the management plans in advance is uh, clearly a lesson learned here. And provide the public with information where, what to do and where to go. If we fast forward to uh, more recent times, um, a crisis I was involved in, which is the eruption of the Sufre Hills volcano in uh, Montserrat in the Caribbean. Uh, this was a, a 
uh, an eruption which is actually still effectively going on from July 1995. So it's a long-lived, protracted eruption producing a cubic kilometer of andesite. And the bottom right, you can see a pyroclastic flow, which uh, essentially, if you're in the way of a pyroclastic flow, you've got very little chance of survival. Just to say a little bit about uh, the way things have been uh, done and developed over the 17 years, we've had a lot of opportunities for uh, uh, developing the emergency management system. There's a Montserrat Volcano Observatory, which is responsible for the day-to-day -day working of the uh, monitoring the volcano and providing advice. There's a scientific advisory commit committee for longer-term hazard and risk assessment. And that advice is given to the Civil Protection Group with representatives of the UK and Montserrat governments and emergency services. So what's the aim of this? The aim is to evaluate evidence, fra evidence framed by understanding of volcanic pr processes to forecast future activity, assess hazards and risk, and take account of the uncertainties. And we've developed on Montserrat a fully probabilistic approach to this. Now, just talk about the evidence base for forecasts and hazard assessments, similar problems, I think, in all hazards. I'd say the three cornerstones of, uh, uh, of doing this well is to firstly have the monitoring data, and you can see there from over the 17 years of the eruption, uh, earthquakes at the top, uh, GPS deformation in the middle, and uh, sulfur dioxide fluxes from the volcano uh, in the bottom. So here's our monitoring data which we're using to inform our assessments. Then we need the past history and, and geology of the volcano and this is the, on the bottom right you'll see a map of the pyroclastic flows early in the eruption uh, and of course what the volcano has done in the past is a guide to your hazard assessment, the hazard footprint. But uh, it actually What's happened in the past is, not, is necessary but not sufficient. On the top right-hand side, you'll see some uh, maps which are actually pyroclastic flow models of uh, modeling the pyroclastic flows and seeing where they go. And if you're, uh, you might just notice, if you look at the sort of top left-hand valley going about northwest from the volcano, you'll see that the historical data doesn't show pyroclastic flows going down that valley, but the models do. Do, and it shows that you need both the models, the modeling with, which capture the understanding of the processes and the past activity to provide the empirical data to help give the evidence base. So that's the sort of information we essentially use. And then uh, these are the sorts of techniques which are evolving in volcanology, and this is just an example. We develop structured methods. We've already mentioned about the event tree. The nice thing about an event tree in a protracted crisis is that you can see how well you actually do. So the red line is what actually happened, and you can bear that with your probabilities. So you can get a sense of how well you're doing forecasting, how often you get things right, or and the most likely thing actually happens. Uh, so we use event trees. We populate those with uh, probabilities, but we also, although not shown, populate those branches with our estimates on the uncertainty in those probabilities. So it's, if you like, the uncertainty and the probability that's also taken into account. And we use expert elicitation methods. Um, and uh, here, I won't go into details, but this is a really excellent method, in my view, of allowing scientific, different scientific opinions to be included as a form of uncertainty. Because if your team of experts has different alternative models or ideas about what's happening, then uh, that's fine. You don't have to necessarily reach a consensus. You can incorporate that within a, an event tree structure um, to, uh, to incorporate uh, scientific differences of scientific opinion. So I think we are on the way to solving this issue of, if you like, uh, uh, dispute as the normal course of science. Um, and um, also you'll see on the left-hand side that we did go into risk assessment. We use population distributions. You'll see a map of Monstrat with different areas where we had information about the populations. And then we did pretty well everything by stochastic Monte Carlo ensemble models, sampling from our uncertainties about the volcano and our uncertainties uh, and, uh, uh, about, uh, for example, the population. So from that sort of method, uh, what sort of products do we produce? Well, firstly, we produce something that we, I would call a risk management map. It's not a hazard map. It's a, a, a division of, of the island of Montserrat into different areas or zones. And you can see that in the map, 
the red zone basically, basically means that the risk is very high in that area. Orange is an area where people can go into under controlled circumstances, for example, radios with the observatory. Yellow is an area where people can go in the, uh, in the daytime, perhaps to look after their livestock, and green's okay. You'll see on the right of that left-hand picture, you'll see the alert levels, one, two, three, and four, and five, and the map is the alert level of the volcano, uh, the, the observatory's estimate of how active the volcano is, and you see the map when it's three. If the volcano becomes more active, the alert level could go to four or five, and the colors of these zones then change, and so the implications on the terms of management change. On the right-hand side, you can see a typical product that we use for, not for the public, but for working with the civil uh, authorities on Montserrat. And you can see uh, what's called a typical FN curve. On the left, on the vertical axis, you've got the probability of N number of fatalities in a six-month period. And on the right-hand side, you've got, uh, sorry, the horizontal axis, you've got the potential number of fatalities. Now, this is a map that's shown uh, in the, uh, um, uh, uh, in the red curve, you see the red curve, which is our best guesstimate, and the shaded area represents our assessment of the uncertainty in where one sigma uh, uncertainty and the upper bound. And what you can see is that uh, this was a period in 2003 when the volcano was very active, and there were uh, several hundred people in living in areas C and B, and the question was, should they be evacuated? And actually, from a societal risk point of view, this is a societal risk curve, you can see that the probability of getting several casualties in the next six months was something like one in 10, a very high risk. Um, if we then did the models again, but this time we remove the people in the models from areas C, uh, C, areas C and you can see the gray curve, the risk curve goes right down. Uh, that's the middle gray curve. And then if people are evacuated from area B, the risk curve goes down. So although the absolute values of this, this risk are not uh, necessarily the uh, clear cut, the point is that you can see the relative risk. And we then compare that with the blue curve, which is hurricane risk in the Caribbean, and the green curve, which is earthquake risk. So you can see that by evacuating, you can reduce uh, the risk to uh, risks which are accepted within the Caribbean region of, of living on those islands. So this is a final product. This is a, 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 ad, a ladder for individual risk, and this relates to risk communication. You can see the individual risk as a log axis on the left-hand side. And you look on the right-hand side, you'll see zone A and B, and you'll see a, a band. And the problem we had was that the Montserrat government wanted to start some economic activities in uh, zone B and A, and they wanted to know what the risk was to workers. And so we did our risk assessment, and we uh, calculated this is last year when the volcano has been very quiet, and so the risk level is quite low. And you can see in the middle hurricane risk, earthquake risk, and accidental death risk. And on the left-hand side, things like road accidents, deaths from all accidents. And you can compare the risk with things that uh, risks that people either uh, are, are familiar with in trying to uh, communicate with either decision makers or the public. I'd just like to make some comments, more of the rather more general comments on risk, which I think is relevant to all natural hazards. There are many kinds of risks, and they may include regulatory or voluntary derived thresholds for making a decision, for example. I think risks need to be precisely defined. Uh, otherwise, you really don't know what you're talking about. And scientists have the skills to assess risk quantitatively, and I'd certainly endorse what uh, Max said, which was I think scientists should get involved in risk assessment. But risk assessment may require information outside science. For example, uh, people, uh, exposure and vulnerability may be areas where the social sciences have the expertise rather than ourselves. So you should be very careful at keeping to our own area of professional expertise. Risk and hazard assessment requires full evaluation of uncertainties. We just have to live with that. Quantitative risk assessment informs decisions and effective communication of risk and the attendant uncertainties are key to effective emergency management. Risk acceptability into informed deci uh, decisions is a societal and political responsibility. So if we deliver the risk, 
uh, well, a well-defined risk, for example, loss of life, it's uh, the, the public and their uh, political representatives and the civil, civil protection authorities have the uh, responsibility for making the decision whether that risk is acceptable or not. My final slide is just some conclusions, issues and open questions. Science provides the information to support policy and decisions. Deterministic methods of forecasting and hazard assessment are no longer adequate by themselves and a, probabilist, a probabilistic approach seems to me to be mandatory, echoing what Tom said. Assessments require structured methods for assessment and analysis of evidence by pooling expertise. Different opinions can be included as a form of uncertainty in such structured uh, methodologies. Scientists should confine their input to providing the best possible information, including data, forecasts, and hazard assessments, confined to their professional area of expertise. Scientists should avoid involvement in decisions, as it should not be their responsibility. Although, in brackets, this is difficult since decisions are made partly or largely on the basis of the science evidence. Emergency management systems should be tested routinely. Science needs to be communicated clearly, and this is challenging. Uh, the, the issue of how we communicate probabilities and uncertainties is uh, perhaps the uppermost example. Should scientists be involved in risk assessment? If yes, is this best to be confined to risks that are precisely defined and can be quantified? How can we deal with low probability, high impact events where precautionary measures such as evacuation may lead to false alarm and loss of public trust? How can probabilities and uncertainties be best communicated? What are the legal ramifications providing expert advice? Things that we might think of are well-kept records of evidence, uh, for example, minutes of meetings, clear documentation of defensible methods and how they are used, transparency, and perhaps internationally agreed standards and best practice protocols where I think there's a, a lot of room for improvement. What is the role of science associations like AGU? training and education in best practice in science methods, communications, and ethics for members. And I would just like to congratulate AGU at their uh, council meeting on Sunday. Uh, the AGU council approved a new ethics committee, uh, so eth ethics policy for AGU, um, which included a considerable emphasis on training of uh, young scientists in some of the difficult issues that they are likely to face in their future careers when they're applying science to society. And perhaps a press, a science associations like AGU can facilitate development of guidelines, internationally agreed best practices, protocols as well. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. We have uh, a lot of time now for questions. There's microphones that are set up in the aisles here in the center and on this side. Please line up at a microphone. Uh, and wait until I call on you. At that time, please state your name, your affiliation, and you, if you have a question for a particular member of the panel, please direct it to that member. So please use a microphone so that we can, everyone can hear you and uh, be aware of what your question is. Uh, we have a question here, please. Okay, I'm John Vidali from the University of Washington, and I guess this is a comment on Tom's talk. I think I agreed with almost everything he said. The only to me, the crux of the matter is what was the risk at the time, and I heard a number of 1% from Tom and 2% from Max, but I think that's the risk of an earthquake that kills a single person. I think an earthquake as big as the event in L'Aquila was even less likely, about one in a thousand the day that it happened, to me, which makes it even less likely that they should have taken a lot of effort to warn people. I mean, I think they should have given a better message, but the situation was not that dangerous, and so to me that reinforces that it really was not criminal what they did. So, John, I guess your basic point is that, uh, if I got it, it was that the, the level of probability for the earthquake was actually quite small. That's right. I mean, taking that, the only study I know that did it, that Weimer study in GRL, um, and I'm sure people would come up with different numbers, but the level was even lower than people were talking about uh, from, that, uh, from the only kind of ATOS study of the risk. Yeah, it, it obviously depends on the model. There is large uncertainty, but, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say it was uh, 
less than 1%. And I think that's where they should start, is what was the risk that day? And as far as I know, the trial didn't even try to establish uh, what the danger was that day. Thank you. Question in the middle, please. And yeah, actually I actually have one comment. I follow very close the trial, and uh, I've also been called as a deponent. Therefore, if it is possible, I would like to take the chance uh, from, the, from what I heard uh, from, uh, by the speakers to try to, 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 um, to summarize what might be the lesson also for the future. In particular about, for instance, process to science, I heard many times saying this is not a process to science. I don't know what the people mean with this term, but actually science was discussed a lot during the trial. I personally heard many times judges, lawyers, prosecutors talk about the outcome of scientific paper in a very, very weird way. I, I felt very uncomfortable with that because they made a very wrong statement about that. Anyway, the general feeling that I have is that about the meaning of probability. I, I understood that they don't have any idea about what, what the probability means. They seem to follow this uh, logical fallacy. Scientists are saying that an event is unlikely, but actually happened. Therefore, scientists were wrong. Of course, we know that this is completely wrong, this statement, but I understood that they were trying to follow such a kind of logical uh, uh, fallacy. For instance, at the very end, the prosecutors, just before the ju judgment, the prosecutors made a parallel between the L'Aquila case and the, Ka and the Katrina hurricane. Okay, again, we know that the, probabil the probability were so different. How can you compare 85% with less than 1% for a completely different event? I mean, just my feeling, but here we have a problem because I don't, I don't think that this is the only problem for the prosecutors in Italy. These guys probably don't have any idea about what is the meaning of probability. And probability is the only way in which we can communicate science. The second point is about the accusation. I, I read many uh, 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 wrong statements that has been said before the Grand Risky Commission, but the accusation was made, was focused on what the Commission said during the Commission, therefore nothing related to what happened before. During that Commission, people said that that seismic hazard was the highest in Italy, and uh, we are not able to predict deterministically an earthquake, and uh, a big event is unlikely. Actually, uh, the accusation at the end was about negligence and our underestimating risk. I have a lot of problem with that because I, I, can, I can understand negligence when there is some sort of best practice, a protocol, like for doctors. Here we don't have anyone. How can you talk about negligence? I mean, who knows exactly what kind of approach you can follow during this kind of sequence. For this reason, I think that we, uh, and this is not a problem only for seismologists, but for all hazards, they have to establish protocols, because only this way you, you might talk about negligence. In this case, I, I, am, I, don't, I don't know, I don't understand exactly what they mean for negligence. And uh, for, um, about underestimating risk, this is related to the first case. You can talk about underestimated risk means that you know exactly what the real risk was. Again, to me, even retrospectively, that event was unlikely, but it happened. And the third one is about the communication. Everyone knows that communication is a very important issue. We understand now that communication is very important, but who has the solution right now because I'm sure that the next event, we can learn a lot of things also from the next event. We have to be very careful because what we learn in the future can be used to accuse for what we could decide right now. And this is to me is unfair. Uh, again, we know exactly that uh, it is very difficult to communicate. We must communicate uh, in a low probability environment. But what is the solution? I see, for instance, that this is very similar to what happened for the terrorism. There are very few, a very small probability they are communicated, but from what I understood, what it seems to me, the way in which it has been done until now is not particularly efficient because at a certain point people don't care at all. This is not probably the best way. We know that we have a problem. We have to focus on this. We will make 
a lot of mistakes also in the future, but we just have to know that we have to, to communicate better. And this is also very important for the L'Aquila trial because many people said there was a reassurance message. Actually, the only people that participated to the meeting, L'Aquila mayor, at the end said, I was much worried than before. He, he was not reassured. He, he, clo he kept the school closed the day after. Just the message that mass media communicate to the people were completely different. I don't know why. I have to say that I don't know why. The, the last, um, the final statement is very general, but I think that we are facing, not as a seismologist, but for all natural hazards, and the decision maker face a decision making under uncertainty. This means that by definition, you cannot be always right. I mean, a posteriori, we uh, could, um, uh, we, we, a posteriori, we will never choose the same action that we decided a priori. Therefore, we have to be very careful. If you accept this, if you accept to be judged in hindsight, we can have a lot of trouble. This is, was very well known from a very important uh, pioneer in statistics that said, don't judge human action by what happened. This has been written 300 years ago, but it seems that we didn't learn anything from it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your thoughtful and heartfelt comments. Comments from the panel, please? Yes. So uh, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Varner a question. Um, so Varner, based upon, I, I think your analysis is right on, uh, do you see uh, any significant changes taking place in the near term to address the basic problems that you identified? I think that generally, in Italy, the people is very scared to do anything. I mean, um, from what I understood, the people now realize that we have a lot of problems, we have a lot of things to do in the near future, but everyone knows that we will do mistakes in the next future. Maybe different from this, but we will do mistakes. And uh, actually, it is a little bit problematic because in the next future, you can be accused for something different, but you can be accused for what we, decide, we, we, we know now. And uh, I think that this is the biggest inertia, uh, the biggest problem for, for us. Um, but in general, I see that we are ready to develop operational earthquake forecast. Civil protection is ready to take the, uh, the probabilistic forecast and taking decision. Uh, we are probably ready, to, to, ready to, to, to write protocols to follow during the seismic crisis. Uh, as INV, uh, we have uh, spent a lot of time also to improve our communication because I, we, I, don't have, I didn't have any background in communication. And uh, we have spent time uh, in order to improve the way in which we can communicate. But actually, we are very reluctant to communicate because, okay, what I could say, maybe yes, maybe no. Okay, but it doesn't help. But I, I'm, I'm always positive. Uh, to be positive, there is no rational, any rationality behind. I'm positive and that's it. And I think that in the next future we can do significant steps ahead in this direction. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Max, did you have comments? Yes. I, th I think um, I understand what is meant by negligence here. If a man in authority steps in front of the public and says, you're safe for every day because of these little earthquakes and he hasn't done his homework, this, to me, is negligence. I do agree with you. I do agree with you. But in the same interview, the same man said, uh, but actually, I'm not an expert. Tomorrow, there will be a Grand Risky Commission with uh, an expert that will say their scientific opinion. Therefore, but, but, again, but, the people don't hear that. I know, they heard I know. you're safer every day. I know. No, no, no. And then he can say whatever else he wants to say. He yeah. is guilty of that statement. And that's it. <laughs> okay, but journalists publish only part of the interview. This is the problem. And again, I, I'm not defending him. I, I don't care. But please, take into account that this is not under discussion due, uh, for, for the accusation. The accusation is focused on what has been said during the Grand Risky Commission, not before.
please take into account this, because otherwise I don't, I don't understand. If this is a problem, I don't understand why is, is, uh, all the people are in trouble and not the only one that before the commission said very wrong things. He, he said wrong things, of course, but he also said in the same interview, oh, but I'm not an expert. Tomorrow there will be a Grand Risky Commission and experts will say their opinion about that. And during the Grand Risky Commission, no one said a so, a so wrong thing. Okay, we have some other folks with questions, please. On this side, please. Hi, uh, my name's Ed Thomas. I'm the president of the Natural Hazard Mitigation Association, and I am not a scientist. Uh, my background is emergency management, community planning, and uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you about negligence. Uh, and I wouldn't disagree with Max's definition at all, except to add that generally speaking, in at least the United States and many other countries, the determination of who is negligent will be made by a jury of your peers. God help you. Uh, my point here is to, uh, I, I, first of all, this is an incredibly excellent panel. I'd like to follow up on what Max said more than anything. When we look at this horrible disaster, this thing that took place, there is a natural human tendency to seek someone to blame. We just heard that. It wasn't the officials' fault, it was the journalists. And the journalists will say it wasn't the officials' fault. There, there is this endless chain of blame going on. What Max suggested was what he would have said, and I think this was brilliant, is take a look at your probability. Build yourself a safe room. That would have been a wonderful answer that inevitably, perhaps, the communication can be, there will be a very large earthquake here. And I can say that. There will be a very large earthquake right here. You can be sure of that. We're not sure exactly when. So it is very prudent to know what you do. If this room started to rock and roll a little bit, I would not want to be under this bay of lights. Uh, I would be trying to make my way up, probably under that stage, or and also uh, knowing that I want to grab my, my my cell phone because that's a good thing to have with you when you're, you know, for for light and for maybe last wishes, to know what you're going to do to have a plan, and so I, I think that we 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 need to have this communication beyond the science of seismology there is a science of risk communication. There is a social science. There, when we talk about setting up policy, we have to take the science of economics, the science of appraisal, and we have to understand the human species, including the human desire to blame somebody. And we got to put this together. I really like the idea of having ethical standards, having standards for the scientists that go out beyond your area of expertise to know what you should, how far you should go, and who else you need to have involved. And also, with respect to what I heard, and I, 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 I am no expert on Italian law or what happened in this situation, but with respect to the scientists who were silent when things were said that perhaps were not correct. In Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence, perhaps in Italian, I do not know, there is a fundamental holding. Silence is assent. If somebody says something that you know is untrue and is putting people's lives at risk, it's a good time to jump up and start shrieking. Thank you very much. Natural Hazard Mitigation Association, we're looking forward to linkage with ADU. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Let me just make one comment. Uh, I think the general thoughts you express are quite uh, correct, and I, I think we can agree with them in, uh, in usual circumstances. The, the problem that makes the L'Aquila case so uh, problematic was the, uh, uh, the existence of this guy who was making predictions. And I think if you look at what happened with the Grand Risk Commission and a number of the interactions between the officials and the public, it was really uh, reacting to the predictions. And 
Uh, given the fact that the, the predictions were kind of causing a problem, I mean, there were clearly uh, bogus predictions that were causing the population to be quite upset, people were leaving villages and so forth, uh, you can sort of understand why there was an attempt to try to, to, to uh, make it clear that these predictions were bogus. And I think that uh, colored the way that uh, many of the officials and the Grand Risk Commission ended up casting the conversation. Uh, in retrospect, it was a mistake, but uh, at the time it must have been, uh, you know, uh, it must have been very difficult to deal with. I, I totally agree with you. I, I, understand, I get that. Let's also understand this. Uh, my, my expertise is a lot more about floods than, than seismology. Uh, I do understand about predictions. I understand about how often you're going to be wrong for every time you're right. To convey the idea that this is probabilistic, that we're suggesting that with respect to Sandy or Superstorm Sandy or Hurricane Sandy or whatever you want to call it, that 24 or 72 hours out, there has to be, there's a fork in the road. Are we going to evacuate the nursing homes in Rockaway Beach or not? Yes or no? Not, not probabilistic. And it has to be made in, 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 in an area of uncertainty. The science to convey you have a 25% chance of being right or a 30% chance of being right. So that means that you're going to look like a fool two times out of three or three times out of four, but it's about people's lives so that you have to make a decision knowing that you may well be wrong and convey that to the public, that in the abundance of caution, mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do. So uh, that, this, this all has to be woven into a vast mosaic of understanding. Yeah. Great. Yes, perhaps I just could comment or, or ask a sort of a question back to you that you said you said you, and I wondered whether you meant the scientists or the, this, the civil authorities or protection agency which has to make the decision. Because uh, it seems to me that's the clear point, that the scientists provide the information and the assessment and uh, evaluate the risk. And then it's up, if you like, to the, the community or the, uh, the who re people who represent the community to evaluate that risk and make a decision. It is, the, indeed, the you to some extent is us. The science, I think, is to convey a clear understanding of what the risk is, what the probability is, mm -hmm. to know that I'm telling you the way things are right now, and I have this other person over here who is the expert on the evacuation times, which is also a science, and you, Mr. and Mrs. Decision Maker, community official, or governor or mayor have to take into account how long it's going to take you to get all those people out of those nursing homes and the number that you've been given is 72 hours or 48 hours or whatever it is. It's usually a pretty long number, uh, you know, you're two or three days out. The best I can give you for a prediction with respect to atmospheric science and, and weather forecasting is that we have a one-third chance of this level and a 50% chance of this level and yeah. convey that in a holistic way so that people can understand this is a little bit like going down and putting your chips on the table at Monte Carlo. But in terms of the decision making to try and convey that there is a very real probability that if you do not evacuate or do not do the following things, people will die. Going back to what Max suggested, inevitably in that area, there was going to be a major quake, right? Is that, can we all agree on that? I'm talking about a cumulative probability. Over perhaps 100 years, there was a catastrophic quake in the 1700s. That was very clear. It was very clear that there was gonna be repetition. What Max said, I think is a direction to go in, to convey that yes, there is a very real risk here at some point, and we don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow or the next day. But here are some things that you can do, meanwhile, to protect your family, and over the next months, 
build this, this, this shelter. Th these, are, these are thoughts that are not going to come from any one science. But if the science community, the social science community, the, the, the science of risk communication, of understanding how the human brain works in terms of risks of very uh, high consequence, low probability events, there's a whole brain science that goes with that. Uh, David Ropeek from Harvard University has written about this. To get that across, and for you as, as science professionals to know what you know and know what also has to be in the room to, so that you can help that decision maker make a good decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have another question in the center, please. Hi, my name is Ryan Armstrong. I'm a student at Colorado College. Um, I may have under, misunderstood this during one of the talks, but it sounded like you said one of the seismologists providing the data had been required to sign something that did not allow him to speak out to the public, um, which effectively limited his ability to protect himself from what ended up happening. Um, as a scientific community, how much pressure should we be putting on the government instead of, or the government that made him sign this form and not allow him to speak to the public, as opposed to the courts who is now sen sentencing him to six years in prison because of what happened. Thanks. Well, uh, are, are you asking for my opinion or what? I, I was just reporting what Enzobowski said, that they, um, the civil protection had the sole authority to speak. I think that perhaps this um, request was not clearly very, very much enforced. I think that people, individual researchers, actually did voice what they were thinking. And university professors can say what they think. I, but here was, I think, a letter, an ag agreement between two agencies of the government, one civil protection and the other the National Institution of Geophysics and Civil Protection wanted to signal we are in charge. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is, um, it seems like there, the lack of communication was due to a lack of information in general. Um, it seems to me that in order to get the most information across, it would be best that there's no limit on how much a person can speak while at the same time having one person speak allows for the clearest amount of communication. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, do you think there should be some balance between this, or do you think that no, everyone should be able to speak No, I think that scientists should speak up. Okay. And um, it's, uh, but there are protocols in government agencies, and you want to avoid the, uh, a war in public, and so I can understand that there's some, uh, some boundaries are defined. Yeah, let, let me comment on this a bit. Um, you raise a very good point. Uh, I'm on the California Earthquake Prediction Evaluation Council, and we report through uh, California Emergency Management Agency uh, to advise the gov governor on situations uh, that would be comparable to L'Aquila. Um, our protocols are that we meet in private and we uh, produce a report that is transmitted uh, confidentially through those, uh, through the agencies, and we're not supposed to release that information uh, through uh, CPEC. Uh, the problem is basically what you describe. When we are in a seismic crisis, uh, many of us are asked to comment on what's going on, and uh, it's important that we be as transparent as possible with the public. So. There's kind of a trickiness associated with uh, those kinds of protocols as to what you can then say as an individual scientist uh, if you are participating in these groups. It's an interesting problem. Great. Thank you. Okay, we have a question on this side, please. My name is John McCluskey. I'm a geophysicist from the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland. I'm speaking as someone who's involved or whose work has been involved in advising um, some of the tsunami hazard in Padang and in other places in western Sumatra. So these questions are, are really close to issues that I, I'm, I'm working with and struggling with. First of all, I feel for Varner and the, the, the passion in, in the way he spoke 
about this issue and we, I would like personally to extend my solidarity to all of those scientists who have been um, uh, convicted in this case. Um, I, I think it is uh, um, incomprehensible and Max's uh, summary of that I think was, was very effective. You know, the public fund our work and they deserve to have our consideration of the hazards, of the scientific assessment of hazards and the communication of that scientific assessment of hazard. Um, at the minute, um, Steve Sparks mentioned the importance of developing protocols for, for um, advising us on how to communicate that um, and the ways in which by devising such protocols, we will be, we'll actually become protected by organizations like AGU. Um, however, at the minute, we don't have those protocols in place yet. Um, and the result is that there are many colleagues of mine, and I'm sure many colleagues of, of other people in the room, who are leaving this and retreating back into the ivory towers. So the question I have for the panel, and I would like to um, not only have the speakers, but maybe some view from AGU, is what is happening to start putting these protocols in place? Um, what should we do? What groups should be put together by organizations like AGU to make this stuff happen, rather than looking back in another five years when some other disaster like this happens and saying, you know, we, what did we do to respond and learn from the L'Aquila case? So where do we go? Well, I, I think that... Uh I see a lack of education of civil protection people in the third world. See that example that happened to me in North Africa, there was a civil protection person who did not dare to wake up his superior in the middle of the night and he had no idea of uh, my capability to, to estimate something. So he believed the television station, two, two people dead, and I think that the television reporting also was um, contributing to people not being helped. And again, the television and the media, they should be educated to some extent. And I, I feel that they should report in such a case, earthquake in North Africa, two people reported dead at 50 kilometer distance from the epicenter and we do not have information from the epicenters and experts estimate 1,000 people may have died. So education of these, these, these critical links, like the civil protection person who turned us down to come and help, had no education and he didn't uh, act, and he was the problem. <clears throat> and here in this case, Lakila, to me, it's the civil protection people who were the problem. Max, I, I agree with that, but my concern is that as a scientist working in the field, I feel as though I'm making it up as I go along, and I'm really unhappy about having to do that. I'm looking for leadership from AGU and from EGU and from the other scientific organizations to put protocols in place to help us not be completely isolated when something like Laquila happens. Yeah. Uh, perhaps a couple of comments, um, one related to what Max said, that... Um, uh, I think it, the, the problem of um, well-educated um, uh, authorities and uh, civil servants uh, and in, uh, is not just confined to the developing world in the UK, and I suspect it's the, true of the US. Uh, these people often change their jobs remarkably quickly. And uh, during the Montserrat crisis, to give you an example, we've, we've been through uh, six chief ministers and seven governors of the island and their administrations and civil servants over the 17 years of the crisis. And each time a new people come in, they have to be, they, they come in with very little knowledge about volcanoes or, or hazards and have to be re-educated. So it's not something you can do one time, it's something you have to work on continually. On the protocols, I sort of simply would say that I completely agree with you uh, about, uh, about the, uh, the need for protocols. In, there was a brief mention of, IF, of the Volcanology Protocol, which was done by the International Association of Volcanology in 1999, in response to some of the sorts of difficulties we've been discussing. And I think the volcanological community have found that very um, helpful, that protocol. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, since L'Aquila, uh, that commu our community has been thinking that it really does need updating and broadening uh, and likely do, it, do something. I would say that uh, I think these are likely to be much more effective if they are international in character. In other words, if, if it's possible for uh, protocols to be developed which are agreed to by uh, all the world's countries, I think they, they have, will have much more impact on governments. Thanks, Dave. In the middle, question, please. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Gerard Fryer. I work at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. Um, I, I just wanted to say that, y yes, while the civil authorities are the people who make the decisions, um, and for some events, the decisions are very, uh, uh, are quite obvious. For example, we had a full, uh, we had a Pacific-wide warning for the Tohoku Oki tsunami. Um, however, for borderline events, or, or many, many events are strange, and, and despite the civil authorities' education, and we try very hard to keep them educated, um, in the end, they, uh, they basically retreat and say, well, what do you, what do you recommend? Um, and the scientist becomes the de facto decision maker. Um, and of course, that makes me very nervous. Uh, mm. But it's reality. It's something you cannot escape. And I don't see how that situation will ever change. Um, but if you can, uh, some, um, to be to be warned or, or um, to be given some advice about how to protect myself in a situation like that, I, I would I'd be very grateful. Uh, just to res as a response, because I you know, can agree that this is a big issue, that because the science is providing most of the information on which the dis co commonly will be providing much of the information on which a decision is made. But I still would maintain that it's very important that the scientist provides the information, analysis and assessment to assess the, the hazard or the risk. And that comes through, I think, to a big issue about whether scientists should get involved in risk assessment. Um, I believe, um, people can correct me in the audience if I'm wrong, but I believe the US Geological Survey does not formally do risk assessment. The British Geological Survey has a similar policy of not doing risk assessment, only hazard assessment. And I think that actually may exacerbate the problem because uh, unless you sort of formally go through to the risk as again in agreement with Mac, uh, Mac some sort of assessment of the risk then it's it's quite difficult because ultimately that's what the decision is going to be made of is a uh, made on is the basis of a, a in a sense a crudely a cross-benefit analysis of taking some action um, therefore uh, scientists maybe need to think much more about the extent to which we get involved in formal risk assessment as well as the hazard assessment. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes and about, I see about four people up, so if we could move along over here, please. Okay, thank you. I'm Robert Geller from the University of Tokyo. I'm a, I'm a seismologist. And one of the things that has been mentioned a little by Max just now, but, but not enough, is how, how to deal with um, journalists. That is, when scientists or, or the civil authorities make an announcement about the risk, their, their audience is usually not the public directly, but journalists who then report that information to the public. And the journalists are, are frequently not very well educated in science. They're frequently in a crisis. They're not going to be specialized science reporters. They're just going to be random reporters who are dispatched um, to the scene. So it's very important for um, whoever is doing the announcement to have written templates or something like that so, so that they can give that to the journalist in writing and as well as having a press conference and have some chance of getting their information across. Also, the civil authorities or, or whoever is making the risk announcement should have a home page set up so that as much as possible they can communicate directly to the public, not only um, by um, personal computers, but also messages to mobile phones and that sort of thing. That All of that needs to be set up in advance. And also, if possible, journalists or, or at least 
newspapers and media organizations, when, when you have a drill, you should try to get them involved in it. So, so um, at least someone in those organizations is um, cognizant of what the problems are. Unless you do that in advance, it, it's never going to work um, at the time of a crisis. Thank you. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Bob. Uh, I mean, we, we tried to emphasize in our report uh, that you have to be uh, you have to be communicating with the public. You have to educate the public into the scientific conversation uh, and into the conversation about risk and hazard. Uh, and you have to do that repeatedly. You can't wait until a crisis, and uh, because people tend to think of crises as being very different, uh, you. Uh, you, you have to be careful that you don't throw at them new information that they just don't know how to deal with. So I agree with you, absolutely. Okay, thank you. We are streaming this session, and we have a question from the web. We're going to try our hand at uh, true high technology and, and see if we can get uh, a question from the web. Is that right? Yes, this question is from Jacob. In tort law, the term act of God is often used to describe events outside of human control that cannot be predicted and for which no one can be held accountable. Does the conviction of these seismologists suggest that public officials think that scientific knowledge has progressed such that geophysical phenomenon no longer fit this criteria? If so, then I fear not only for seismologists and volcanologists, but also for the climate community as the consequences of climate change become more apparent. How can scientists better protect themselves against the consequences of doing their job? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it comes back to this issue of how we're characterizing uh, the problem. And, uh, you know, it's it really, we have to be able to use the concepts of probability. And, you know, Varner uh, articulated this earlier in the discussion where he pointed out that uh, you know, uh, people tend to think of this like a bet. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Uh, but in fact, we know that any probabilistic estimation is going to be right some of the time and and uh, wrong some of the time. So, um, in my view, this really depends upon how we communicate probabilistic concepts and use them in uh, the a development of strategies for dealing with different situations. And people have talked about thresholds. Uh, all of that is going to have to be set up. And, you know, I think it's pretty clear we haven't done very much in these low probability situations. Uh, there is, at least in the earthquake business, very little literature on the use of low probability estimates in uh, risk communication. And uh, we're going to have to just do more uh, to address those issues. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left. In the center, a question, please. My name is Sarah Karina. I'm a geologist, not a seismologist, and uh, though now I work in Germany, I basically was educated and grew up in Italy. And I do actually agree with the fact that we need better communication and we need better education. But that's a long-term project because uh, basically, uh, if, you, if you think California, you know people here are going to uh, find a table, hide under it, because they've, they've heard it from school. Uh, in Italy, the first thing that people will do is run for the door. Uh, the normal thing is you go outside and you stay outside. So it's a matter of education. It's also a matter of teaching children science. So they're lacking in science education to the point that, as he was saying, uh, you talk to these judges, they don't understand probabilities, but nobody understands what probability, probability is. It's not just the judges. I mean, ask anyone of the public. You can't talk to them in terms of probability because they have no idea what it is. It's just basic science concepts uh, that people sh tools that people should be able to use in everyday life that are lacking. And uh, this is not something that you solve for the next crisis or for the next five crises. It's a long-term project, and when you have a government that does not invest in science and in science education, that's the result. Thank you. A uh, question on this side, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lucy Jones. I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey, and I do want to first comment that we are undertaking risk assessments at this point. We've got the pager activities that are going on immediately after an earthquake, but also we just completed our... Um, 
the science strategy for natural hazards and called upon doing risk assessment, working. Obviously, you have to partner with the social sciences to be able to do it, but it's our obligation to make sure that risk assessments get done, even if that means a partnership with the outside, depending on where the expertise will lie. But I also want to comment on the idea of the, the separation or the different roles for the civil protection and the scientist. And I think it's very difficult to make that a completely clean break. Um, I mean, I actually began in, in seismology with work in China in 1979, looked at how they did take off, you know, carry off evacuations with the Haichung earthquake, and recognizing that they did it at probabilities way below anything that we would undertake in the United States. And the fundamental difference was that the social consequences of acting would be very different. And from that, I worked towards trying to create these probabilities and have this as a way of being able to provide that communication. I do the probability, somebody else who understands the social consequences decides what to do about it. And we've sort of evolved a process in California that when we are in times of, of you know, higher than background but still low probabilities, we communicated, as Tom was describing, through CPEC with the state authorities. The problem is, is as a situation, as you remember, Tom, a few years ago, we came up and said, we think the chance of the San Andreas earthquake today is between 1 and 5 percent. Still a very low number, but much higher than the background. And we gave that information confidentially to the state, who said, thank you. And we said, where's the public statement? They said, we're not going to do one. So the process took long enough. We never went out and made a public statement. Uh, but we, if the earthquake had indeed happened that day, and it had come out that a group of scientists had told the state there was a 5% chance, because I'm sure the 1 to 5 would have disappeared, 5% chance that there was a, the San Andreas earthquake and we had done, we had made no public statements, we would have been in a situation perhaps not facing criminal prosecution, but I think there would have been uh, a lot of, uh, we, we wouldn't have been uh, treated very well in that position. And we need to, I think, do more than just say this is our job and that's their job and a better partnership. And actually because of that, the U.S. Geological Survey is at this point actively trying to create a framework and a protocol for making statements about the probabilities of earthquakes in a variety of situations. We are in partnership with risk communication professionals, schools of communication, and we hopefully, over the next year, we want to work with our colleagues. We want to come up with a, a strategy for quantifying and, and characterizing this, this situation because we can't continue to do it in an ad hoc manner. Uh, where Tom refers to operational forecasting, I think that operationalizing it becomes absolutely critical. There's too many decisions to be making them in a time of crisis. Thank you. And Lucy, you may recall that uh, I, I think that the situation you were talking about was two weeks before La uh, Yeah, that's and right. And the statement that uh, we drafted in CPEC um, actually would have worked very well in La if it had been used. And as you pointed out, even though we drafted the statement, it sort of went nowhere. And that reflects back on several of the issues that were just being discussed about uh, communication, education, and trying to figure out uh, how we actually, uh, you know, act on uh, this scientific information. Well, right. And, and in the L'Aquila situation, you've got the same thing where you've got scientists that have said a technically correct statement, public statements coming from civil protection officials that are conveying the wrong overall impression. And, you know, it's difficult to go in and go publicly, you know, should the scientists have stood up and said, wait a minute, they're saying the wrong thing, that wasn't what we meant. You are then undermining a lot of social, you can cause a lot of social problems by having that public fight. So it's anything but clear cut, and the more that we can figure it out beforehand, and in partnership with emergency managers, they're working with us to create this framework of the statements that will be made, um, but we have to do it. Yeah. We're always going to make mistakes in the, in the heat of the battle. 
Yes, just a comment that, uh, I mean, it seems to me that's a very positive move, I think, to move into risk assessment because it seems to me completely inevitable that scientists have to do that. Right. Partly because we've got the skills. A lot of risk assessment involves quite sophisticated modelling. And the second point that you made uh, very eloquently is that, of course, this has to be in partnership because we don't have the, the to make, to assess risk very often we need uh, people from other disciplines and expertise and but experience. But they're out there and wanting to work with us, so. Yes, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. Work to do. Uh, last question briefly, please. We have just a minute or so. Yes, my name is Mauro Rosi. I'm Italian, I'm volcanologist, uh, and I'm currently the vice president uh, of the Great Risk Commission of Italy. And probably you know that uh, uh, the President, Vice President, and Honorary President, uh, they resigned uh, uh, after the, the L'Aquila trial because uh, we felt uh, in a difficult position of uh, providing or offering uh, objective evaluations of uh, situations to the, to the civil protection. Uh, what, I want to know, what I want to say here is that uh, as an Italian scientist, I wish to thank a lot the international community for the reaction that they, 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 that they, they had. Franco Barberi has been my professor at the university, and it was very difficult for me in Italy to take a position because uh, we were operating as officials uh, in a way, so uh, we couldn't do any more than uh, uh, giving our resignation for the for what we are doing. We were doing, but I think that uh, the Lacula trial might represent uh, an important uh, turning point uh, in the sense that. Uh, it, it, it became clear the importance uh, of the cohesiveness of the international community, scientific community. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the problem, the number and, uh, and size of problems we have on the ground are huge, huge. And uh, I think that uh, if we want to address them, we must be prepared to operate at international level. So sharing, uh, 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 all, all things we can and also developing uh, protocols for uh, uh, shared protocols for, for these kinds of situations. I think that the work we have to do is, is very, very big and the they co international cooperation, at, I, I see it as a fundamental tool for solving these things. Thank you. I think that's an eloquent way to end the session. Thank, let's thank this excellent panel and thank you for all of your participation.